Hello, my name is Sam Felton, and welcome to Expert Interviews on Smash the Fat Live. Uh, and with me today, I'm very, very happy to introduce to you Dr. William Lagargos, um, who is a nutritional, uh, a nutritional biochemistry and physiology PhD. He was currently researching, you know, obesity, inflammation, and insulin resistance. He has a blog called Calories Proper, which I highly recommend that you check out. Some great posts on there um, from Dr. Lagargos, and um, also you can check out his. Um, absolutely fantastic book that we're going to be talking about today called The Poor Misunderstood Calorie, which is available on Amazon through the links below. Um, so, how are you doing, Phil? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, Sam. Thanks for having me. Oh, good. No worries. No worries. And did I get your last name right? Sorry. Uh, Lagakis. Lagakis. Yeah, there yeah. we go. There we go. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, it sure is, man. Cool. Um, so... Um, getting into it, as I mentioned, you've got a, a, a book called The Poor Misunderstood Calorie, um, and I finally got around to reading it, because um, yeah, I've been so busy over these past couple of months with everything, um, with my own calorie experiment, but finally yeah. got around to, to reading it, absolutely fantastic, and probably one of the most comprehensive books that I've read on health nutrition, obesity, insulin resistance, and everything like that. It's absolutely fantastic. Thanks. Really, Thank really you. amazing stuff. Um, and, you know, one of the first chapters um, goes into why no proper calories applies to weight loss. Um, so can you explain what you mean by that? Sure, sure. I think calorie, calorie is a word that it has so many different distinct meanings that it's it's really a misnomer. It's impossible to understand. I mean, to the biochemist, a calorie is a measure of heat. It's the amount of heat that's required to increase the temperature of water by one degree centigrade. And it's mm -hmm. always the same. It's sort of uh, an immutable number. It's a measure of heat, and that's a quantity that doesn't change. Whereas when people are looking at calories expended during exercise, you know, you can walk up a flight of stairs, one of the examples I use in the book is you can slowly walk up a flight of stairs or you can you know, stop and do a jumping jack on every step. Uh, in the end, the same distance has been, you've accomplished uh, moving the same distance, but you're going to burn drastically different amount of calories depending on you know, how you do that activity. So it changes. So you can't just say, okay, I'm going to burn 2,000 calories today. It's going to, you know, some days you're burning 1,500, some days 2,500. It's virtually impossible to know how that's going to go. Um, and also, a completely different type of calorie is the type of calorie that's found in food. You, know, you, mm -hmm. read, the back of, you read the back of a package of food, it says, you know, whatever, 150 calories. Um, and so that's what you think you're getting. However, that's going to depend on what else you're eating that, that food with. It'll change person to person. It'll change, you know, if you haven't had anything to eat that, yet that day and this is the first time how you're going to metabolize those calories, how you're going to you know, digest and absorb them. And also, if you're eating them with, I don't know if it's a high fat or a high protein meal, how mm -hmm. it's going to be partitioned in your body. So just saying 120 calories doesn't really tell you very much. Actually, it doesn't tell you anything at all. Yeah, yeah it's really so painting food with a really broad brush. Exactly. So, you know, it's, it's saying that, you know, a thousand calories worth of, of, of sugar is the same as a thousand calories of salmon. And of course, yeah, we, we know that, you know, it's going to create different um, biochemical reactions within the body. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you, you sort of go into detail in this, within the book, um, in two chapters where you ask the question, is a calorie a calorie in terms of biochemistry and is a calorie a calorie in terms of nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, to a biochemist, I'll never say a calorie isn't a calorie. I mean, a calorie is a calorie, it's a fact. But it, when it comes to nutrition, it's meaningless. You know, calories yeah. are, you know, all different calories are metabolized different ways. They have different effects on energy expenditure, different effects on body composition, and that's what matters in nutrition. Yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? Um, and so when um, you, you talked a moment ago just about sort of the nutrient partitioning, um, and again, you go into detail 
in this within the book. Now, so how does um, your body partition uh, nutrients? And okay. So it depends on, I mean, the hormonal response to food. So, you know, just the very basics is things like insulin. When you have a lot of uh, sugar, a lot of carbohydrate rich foods, you get a lot of insulin. That's where it tends to promote the uh, fat storage effects, the adipose. Uh, and on the other end of the, end of the spectrum, you have you know, protein rich foods like meat, salmon, eggs. They tend to go more towards building muscle. And so if you design a diet with you know, low sugar and higher protein, you're going to end up sort of nutrient partitioning away from fat stores and towards your muscle, and that's ideal. Regardless of your end body weight, I think body composition is sort of a more important uh, indicator of health status. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, if you're eating a sort of a, um, more of a fat and protein rich diet compared to say um, a carbohydrate rich diet, um, you're going to get sort of two different body compositions. Yeah, yeah, the, the hormonal profile will tend to favor that. I mean, the calories can be the same. It can be 2,000 calories each, but yeah. I think the hormonal response to the, the diet is going to help mediate the body composition effect. Okay, so let's take the example of, say, the, actually the carbohydrate diet. Let's start off with that. What, what happens when we're eating high-carbohydrate foods? Okay, so when you eat the high-carbohydrate the high food, uh, the main hormonal response is going to be insulin. Insulin is yeah. going to tend to, its role is to basically get the fuels out of the blood, so it's going to have the carbohydrates that you eat, they turn into glucose in the blood. Insulin wants to get that glucose cleared out. Uh, there's also going to be the fact that you've eaten, if there was fat in that meal, that'll get the insulin will help push the fat into the adipose. It will also store a little bit of glucose. Uh, glucose is going to go primarily into the muscle and liver, but it tends to be a storage hormone. That's sort of what happens. With yeah, the that's the bottom line. Meal. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, the insulin sort of drives any dietary fat that's in that meal into the fat cells, yeah. essentially. Now, um, there is a mechanism where carbohydrates can get converted into fat, um, and that can get a little bit confusing for people. Um, can you maybe explain that mechanism and sort of its sure. actual importance in terms of people becoming obese? Okay. I, I would say carbohydrate can turn to fat, but that's not yeah. really a quantitatively really important pathway. Yeah, uh, I think it's the insulin causing the fat storage. Insulin prevents lipolysis from happening. Uh, that's the major effect. You're not going to have too much of this de novo lipogenesis that's going to, you know, cause all of the sugar you eat to turn into fat. Yeah. The more it's actually it's actually the insulin response that you're getting from the sugar that's driving yeah. fat and keeping fat in the fat cells. Yeah. As well, rather than the um, the carbohydrate to fat mechanism the DNL right. Um, right. that's yeah making the fat so um, yeah it's, it, we've got to make it clear that it's actually the the process of insulin rather than the DNL um, that's making people obese. Um, so what happens when somebody's eating a, a high fat um, diet with low carbohydrates? So that's that's the complete opposite. It's, you get no insulin response, so your body probably going to keep on releasing fat from the fat cells. Uh, you're going to have, you tend to have a higher levels of energy expenditure with these diets, the mm -hmm. uh, low carbohydrate, high fat, uh, moderate protein. So it's not, you're not going to go into that, you know, fat storing phase. You're going to keep right. on burn, burning fat and that's sort of why I like to stress the nutrient partitioning is sort of more favorable on the low carbohydrate, high fat, yeah, yeah, you absolutely. Just stay away from that insulin fat storage scenario. Yeah, that's right. Um, but if you if you um, recommend this to somebody that is that is obese and is a diabetic, type two diabetic, and they still have you know a lot of insulin sort of running through their body and things, um, and you put them onto a high fat diet, um, does that mean that 
you know, the dietary fat that they're now eating, and they're, they're low carbohydrate and high fat. Um, does that mean that at first that dietary fat is still going to be stored? Uh, well, I, I don't think so. I, I think that no. the, diabe the diabetic, probably the most important thing they can do for their life is to go yeah. to a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. It's extremely effective, extremely yeah. quick acting. Uh, it's a very important Maneuver. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, now, there, there are some skeptics on this idea that a high fat diet um, actually makes you slim, um, which seems counterintuitive, but when you look at the biochemistry, it's actually what happens. Um, right. Now, what do you say to those people that, you know, um, eating a high fat diet doesn't lead um, to becoming diabetic or, or anything like that? I tend not to engage if somebody wants <laughs> to argue. I mean, there are people that just want to argue, yeah. and that's fine. I think that on the whole, you can go just look in the medical literature. You can find 100 studies that have done these comparisons, and they all tend to favor the, uh, I mean, it's not like huge differences. You can get you know, people that are going to strictly adhere to the low-fat diet, and they can lose weight. Mm -hmm. I think more often than not, if you just want to do direct comparisons, you're going to end up having more favorable, more favorable results with a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, on the whole. And yeah. that, you know, I wouldn't want to be the one to argue that. I would just let people direct them to the literature and say, here's where it's been done. You know, look at these studies. And that, regardless, of, I mean, the biochemistry does make sense and it does favor that. But regardless of the biochemistry, you can just look at the actual diet. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, we, we've talked quite a bit about insulin and its response um, within the human body. Then there's a, there's a couple of other issues um, with, uh, with obese and diabetic um, patients, as well as metabolic syndrome and everything. Um, and that being um, fructose and leptin, uh, which is one of the chapters that you go into in the book. Um, can you explain how, how that is intertwined. Sure, I mean it's very complicated, and I'm not a, I'm not an expert. Uh, what, <laughs> what seems to be the I beg to differ, Bill. I beg to differ. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sam. What seems to be the case is leptin is involved in you know hungry satiety hormones. When you have when your fuel is full, you have you're well fed, you get these high leptin levels, which trigger the brain to say, okay, you can stop eating now. Uh, when people get the metabolic syndrome and obesity, that tends not to work so well. So they get the high leptin levels, but they're still hungry, still eating. And there's been a lot of very interesting animal studies that suggest sugar, or more specifically fructose, might be part of the problem here. And fortunately, we need to remove the carbohydrate. On the low carbohydrate diet, that takes away a lot of the fructose, a lot of the high fructose corn syrup, a lot of the table sugar. When you get rid of that, that's sort of working towards uh, correcting these leptin resistance problems, and it, it seems to remove one more roadblock. And what? Sorry, that Bill, I lost it, it. So when you remove the carbohydrate, that takes away the fructose, the high fructose corn syrup, and the table sugar, and that sort of just gets one more roadblock out of the way towards your weight loss. Yeah, absolutely, because it is, it's a very, very complicated um, condition um, or disease. Um, now, it has now been classified as a disease. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Actually, I think that's, uh, it's very, it seems like political. Like mm. it has, like I'm not really sure what the, uh, the political implications are, but from my impression is it's going to have to do with the ongoing healthcare debate uh, what can and what can't be subsidized or taxed, but again, that, that's politics. That's way further out of my scope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't think it really matters whether or not it's a condition or a disease. I mean, you, the thing is, we want to prevent it. Right. Is we treat it and prevent it. it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Yeah. Treat it and prevent it. You're quite right. Um, and you know what? How? How is the best way to uh, to prevent and treat? Um, obesity um, and type 2 diabetes and, and metabolic syndrome as a whole? Uh, in, my, in my opinion, I think that 
just the, the diet should be the first line therapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know when a type 2 diabetic patient walks into the clinic, they're probably going to walk out of there with very little diet advice and a prescription yeah. for metformin. Yeah. I think that should change. I think the first thing that should happen is they should be advised to see a dietitian or a nutritionist or even start training the clinician to help this person engage in the high fat low carbohydrate diet. That's probably mm -hmm. the most important thing that's going to have the biggest impact on their health and quality of life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's the most important thing in my yeah. opinion. It's something that we sort of drive home every single week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we yeah. smash the fat and eat the fat as well. And yeah. um, you know, the the focus with a um, a high fat low carb diet is is the fact that it's all about real food. Yeah. Um, now, do you think if we didn't have sugar and refined grains within the diet, do you think that we'd we'd have any of these metabolic issues that are going on now? Not nearly as many. Yeah. I think that, I think processed foods, junk foods, empty calories, that is part of the uh, part of the horcrux here. That's if you get rid of those, like the whole uh, the paleo movement, where it's focused on whole foods, no processed foods. I think that's a Excellent step in the right direction. I, I don't. Yeah, think, exactly. I mean, I don't think you know carrots have. They're loaded with carbohydrates, but I don't think the obesity epidemic was caused by carrots and sweet potatoes. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much just processed foods, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and you know, the thing is, when I see experts on the news and things like that, and and um, the, the the few times that I've been on the news talking about this. Um, the question always crops up, um, well, or the, the point always comes up about energy-dense foods, right? Um, which, which is such a strange phrase, isn't it? Energy-dense yeah. foods. Um, yeah. Because, you know, some of the most natural foods on the planet, nuts, for instance, are probably some of the most energy-dense foods yeah. on the planet. Yeah. Um, now, you know, that could possibly put me in a theoretical calorie surplus. Um, but one of the um, things that you ask in the book is, you know, can you get fatter without a positive energy balance? Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah is can you? I I think uh, you you can, and it, this is one of the more complicated parts of the book, and I, mm. I think it it depends on how you're sort of defining calorie surplus. And there's been very very good, in my opinion, animal studies that show you can take a mouse and reduce their calorie intake by a very small amount and introduce some sort of stressor into their life and they will lose a little bit of weight but they won't lose any fat mass so at, by the end of the experiment they end up actually having a higher body fat percentage even though you were feeding them less so by that definition of calorie deficit you know they were technically eating less however uh, because of the hormonal profile, they mm. ended up having a higher body fat percentage. And you know, as I was saying before, I think that that change in body composition is more important than the change in weight. Mm. So they they yeah, could yeah, actually yeah. end up a little bit lighter, but if they end up having a higher body fat percentage, that's not good. Yeah, that's not good at all, is it? It's not good at all. Um, now, uh, where does exercise well, I, one fit One more thing on that. that oh, go for okay, it. Go for I mean, in humans, this happens too. When they have a yeah. high stress lifestyle, that can cause sort of nutrient partitioning in the opposite direction. They can end right. up storing, storing more fat in the, mm -hmm. the nefarious depots, like within the gut viscera. The visceral fat is, is bad. And there's even been some interesting sleep studies where they've controlled food intake and the calories. But, you know, if you just take these people and put them on these bizarre sleeping regimens which disrupt their circadian rhythm, that too mm -hmm. could end up, they could end up losing muscle mass and increasing yeah. fat and it's because of the stress and it's because of the hormonal profile and they weren't in a, a caloric surplus by strict the strict definition but mm -hmm. you know it causes them to get fatter yeah. and have a more positive energy balance absolutely and, and this, this is one of the um things that i'm seeing happening in sort of the research community is that we, we're starting to realize that you know it fat tissue is, is actually growing, isn't it? Yeah. And it's and it's and it's sort of similar to a tumor in that sense. It's sort of like it gets quarantined 
and you know it's not able to be used you know and it just starts to grow and grow and grow um, and it's, it's not down to gluttony and sloth right um, and sort of yeah right. going back to what we were um, just about to talk about in terms of you know is it because people are not exercising enough um, where I, does that still fit in I think exercise is very important for a lot of things yeah mm -hmm. I mean even you know some people say including myself will say exercise will build up an appetite so you might actually end up eating more I still think it's better to exercise uh, that helps to correct a lot of the defects mm -hmm. and even people that don't lose weight will experience you know significant metabolic improvements with exercise yeah and just just when I think about you know the desk job where people sit for eight hours a day and then they go home and they still don't move very much you know you have a lot of muscle that you're not using and you're probably gonna end up losing that muscle mm. and I, I'm a fitness enthusiast and I, I think it's good to exercise move walk around I mean you don't need to have this $50 a month gym membership to increase physical activity in your life Mm. But that's an important thing for health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, one of the things that we're starting to try and hit home a lot more um, at Smash the Fat is the fact that um, you know it's not the amount of calories that you're burning, right? It's so it's about trying to um, create a um, an environment within your body where all of your hormones are firing correctly. Yeah. And part of part of that solution is exercise and, and moving your body because as you were just saying you know your muscles are there to be used and part of that is what sort of makes all of the hormones fire correctly in the right sequence so that then you know your engine is running correctly um, and also you know along with boosting your immune system um, to you know having good posture so that you know all of your digestive tract is in the right place you know? <laughs> and things yeah. like this and like you know you can really go into detail there yeah. but I'm um, like you know the whole point is is that you know you're trying to put everything in alignment from like you know your joints to your hormones firing in the right direction yeah that's a great take on it that's, that's excellent I like that a lot of getting everything in line and uh, I mean even clearing excess fuel out of the blood uh, and putting it to good use. These, these are all good things. That's awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and you, uh, you recently, uh, well, uh, you followed my recent 5,000 calorie experiment. Um, we, just, just before we, we started the interview, <laughs> you, you uh, said some very nice words about it. Uh, I appreciate that, Bill. Um, but yeah, what, well, I think what the experiment did, was awesome. Yeah, what did you think? I, th I think it was awesome. I think it, uh, it it really drove the picture home that all calories are not created alike in terms of nutrition. Um, people out there listening, uh, Sam ate over 5,000 calories a day for three for three full weeks, and by all definitions, that should be a calorie surplus. Uh, but he didn't get that, and there's pictures to prove it. I, I love the experiment. I think it was great, and I think it had some important uh, take home take home messages and one of which which Sam and I were discussing before the interview I think that when somebody wants to switch to the low carbohydrate diet you don't just want to remove the carbohydrates and then be starving I think what this experiment showed was you can add back high fat high protein foods so that you know you're fully satisfied you have no hunger and you can do this in with removing all the carbohydrates and that's a good way to get started with the, with the diet yeah, absolutely. And if you haven't seen the experiment, go to the Huffington Post. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of good ones. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Because, sure. um, yeah, that's this is the thing. Um, and like we were just touching on before, it's all about getting everything within your body in alignment. Like, you know, not in a woo-woo sense, but in a sense of, you know, just getting everything going in the right direction from, you know, in terms of your circadian rhythm. You know, so it should be like you've got to nail the sleep, you've got to nail the diet, you've got to nail the exercise, and you've got to nail the stress as yeah. well. Um, so that, you know, everything is flowing as it should be. Um, so that then, you know, your body's going to return to what should be its normal homeostasis, you know, um, in terms of, yeah, just releasing fat and everything. And, you know, you don't have to be in a theoretical calorie um, deficit to actually lose weight. 
yeah, yeah. He, was, he was by fan. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I think I'm, that's great. Mm, I appreciate that, Bill. Um, so, um, in terms of what Dr. William Lagargos uh, eats, what's your daily diet look like? Uh, my daily diet is probably low carbohydrate, high fat. I do exercise a lot, and I keep a probably good moderate level of protein in the diet, uh, and a lot of variety. I could tell you what I ate today, but it would be different from what I ate last week. Usually, mm -hmm. pretty rich in animal protein, um, dairy, fat, butter. I do like bacon. Um, yeah, dark man. Chocolate. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I do like dark chocolate, too. Yeah. Um, and variety. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Variety is, is pretty massive. And, and trying to eat somewhat seasonally, if you can, sure. Um, sure. Is, it, is probably helpful. Um, but in terms of, because we hear this a lot from, um, from the news that, it, you know, animal foods are, are killing us, apparently. Now, how, how true is that? How true is that? I would say probably zero. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe any of that when it comes into the news. Occasionally, I read it just so that I can send out a funny Twitter tweet about it. But <laughs> I don't. I don't buy any of those studies. Uh, I think you know a healthy diet is one that includes a you know, variety of animal foods. Yeah. Uh, in in basic nutrition, I used to teach a nutrition class, and you know, for the first half of the class, it was all about the vitamins and minerals, and you know you teach what they do, how they work in the body, how much of them you need. Who's at risk for deficiency, and in almost every case, who's at risk for deficiency is, you know, the vegetarian people who have selective diets where they restrict or don't eat any of the animal food. I think. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's it's becoming quite evident that, like, you know, um, if you don't include some animal products, whether that be sort of, you know, just some dairy, even, yeah, sure. um, yeah. then you know you're going to be deficient in quite a lot. Of, of uh, micronutrients, which which isn't going to be good um, for your sort of bodily alignment. Um, yeah. Now uh, we've got a few questions for you from Facebook. Um, so starting off with this first one from Phil Thompson: um, Is there a scientific explanation for stalled people with an apparent reasonable and persistent calorie deficit yet no weight loss? that has been verified by measurement, or do we just assume they're secret eaters? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I, I don't assume people, I mean, they might be a secret eater, I don't know, but I think there are absolutely good uh, things. And most importantly, that's going to be changes in energy expenditure or mm -hmm. stress profile, hormonal landscape, if that changes, uh, it's fair game. I mean, you could you could calculate your calories, count them perfectly, put yourself in a couple hundred calorie deficit, mm -hmm. be sticking to it. I mean, I don't believe that calorie counts are important. I usually think they're wrong. I mean, even if you're looking at the back of the package and you're adding everything up perfectly, I even think that is misleading. Yeah, but, it's just both. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, even if you're doing all that perfectly, if energy expenditure declines, uh, then you're no longer in a calorie deficit, and your weight loss is going to stall without you secret eating. Uh, or yeah. if you start getting too stressed out, uh, losing sleep, all these things are going to affect sort of the dynamic fluctuation of uh, energy intake, energy out, and could cause you to stall, or even mm -hmm. start, you know, maybe you're not gaining weight, but you're losing muscle and gaining fat. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, number two uh, is from David uh, Sinide. I'm not sure how you say his last name. Uh, but has there ever been a clinical study showing low carb has a statistically significant advantage over other diets in regards to body composition when protein amounts have been kept the same? Uh, with that, I'm going to say yes. Well, yes and no. I mean. Mm -hmm. Protein protein intake is, is important. In, in most studies where they do change, when they go on to the uh, low carb and they increase the protein, have moderate protein, that is usually going to be a more significant impact on the muscle. But still, if you just compare, you know, carbohydrate exchange for fat, uh, when they do the low the, the weight loss studies, you do tend to have a more favorable 
impact on body composition with the low carbohydrate diet. I mean, the differences are sort of like, you know, two people lose uh, six or eight pounds, you end up getting a little bit more weight loss with the low carbohydrate diet, and of the weight that is lost, uh, a little bit higher percentage of it is body fat loss. So, I mean, I've written about this on the blog a couple times. I'm pretty confident in saying more often than not, you have a more favorable change in body composition with the low carbohydrate diet. Mm, yeah, and is there is there any case where um, you know a high fat, low carb, moderate protein diet would not you know lead to um, to fat loss? You, you ask, is there any case? And I would yeah. say, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, there is. <laughs> of course, uh, there's, you can find a study proving or disproving anything. Mm. But I would say, on the whole, when you just took a, take a look at the, the big picture, the whole yes. landscape of these studies, you tend to find uh, a very significant trend that you get a little bit more weight loss with a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, and of the mm. weight that's lost, more of it is fat mass. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, absolutely. The, you, I could find a study showing the opposite. Anybody could find studies that show the opposite, like individual cases. But on the whole, getting more favorable as well. Mm, absolutely. Um, and then last one uh, from Phil Thompson again. Uh, do studies in metabolic chambers confirm that calorie differences equate to changes in body composition when everything is correctly accounted for? Well, that is the, uh, the world's most complicated. I know, he's, he's oh, right, like quite, quite complicated questions, but yeah. I think what he's getting at here is that, yeah, as long as everything's um, correctly accounted for, um, with studies that are using metabolic chambers, um, that, you know, that the calories, that it is all about calories is what he's getting at. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the metabolic chambers are used to assess energy expenditure, which mm -hmm. they do that by measuring gas exchange. You know, a, a known concentration of oxygen is coming into the room, uh, you're burning fuel, which uses oxygen, you're producing carbon dioxide, so then that, those gases leave the room, and you know, it, it's measured, then they can use equations to determine energy expenditure. I think that those devices are probably pretty accurate, and what I would say to address the question, is they probably do track fairly well with body composition. For example, mm -hmm. you get two people, one person has more lean muscle mass, uh, or more fat-free mass, and another person, they're going to have a slightly higher energy expenditure because the muscle is sort of what tends to increase the metabolic rate. So if you're going to try and track it in terms of the uh, calories burned and body composition, I'd say the metabolic chamber study probably be do it that pretty well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. Uh, well, that's all the questions from Facebook. Um, now, our final question, Bill, is is what are you up to at the moment? What's going on? Okay, um, at the moment, I'm working on another book. Cool. I'm trying to make uh, the, the the four misunderstood calorie is sort of uh, how calories work, what they are, why they are or are not important. Um, why you should stop counting calories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of futile. Uh, the book I'm working on is going to be more more towards diet, more towards as Sam and I were discussing before, were discussing before the interview. Sort of what do you, how do you turn this into an action plan? Mm -hmm. What makes sense? What works with your lifestyle? And it should be good. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Is, it, is there a uh, ETA on that? No, no, no problem. <laughs> no problem. I'm working as hard as I can, but no problem. <laughs> sure thing, man. End of the year? Perhaps. That's a reasonable Yeah, point. perhaps. Yeah, that would that, be a good goal, I think, for sure. Uh, well, let us know um, as, soon, as soon as it's ready and when it's available uh, on, on Amazon. And, okay. uh, yeah, you can, you can, you can, we can get you back on the show to chat about um, some proper hardcore dietary advice. Awesome. Yeah, man. Sweet. Cool. Um, well, finally, um, just so everyone knows, you can grab Bill over on Twitter, at Calories Proper, um, his blog, CaloriesProper.com. And then finally, um, if you type in the poor misunderstood um, calorie on Amazon, you'll get it up.
right there or in the uh, description below through through the links there. Um, and finally, Bill, thank you so much for your time today, mate. Very real, real pleasure um, chatting to you and, and getting to know you a little bit more and a bit more about your, your philosophy um, on everything. Um, thank you, Tim. Thanks for this opportunity and, and thanks for having me on. Great. No worries, Bill. No worries. Well, thanks again, mate. And uh, I'll uh, I'll see you soon. Bye. Peace. Cheers, bud.